Part 1 You will hear a man inquiring about joining a cricket club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Monarch Cricket Club. Can I help you? Yes, I'm new to the area and I was hoping to join your cricket club. As a player or just a club member? Well, both actually. If I could get onto a team, that would be great. Well, you've called at the right time of year. We have tryouts next week. Let's get you an application to join the club as a member first, then you qualify to try out. What's your first name? George. OK, George, great. And what is your surname? Abbott, George Abbott. That's A-double-B-O-T. Often people think it's spelled with two T's at the end, but it isn't. Thank you, Mr Abbott. Now, what is your date of birth? Actually, it's my birthday today. I'd completely forgotten with the move and everything. Oh, many happy returns. So, it's the 18th of March. Can you tell me the year, please? Of course. I was born in 1990. Excellent. We are always happy to get some young blood into the club. Now, as far as membership goes, do you know any of our current members? We generally like our members to be introduced to the club. I don't know anyone, really. I've just moved to the area. My new neighbour, Max Blythe, suggested I join. Is he a member? Yes, Max has been with the club for many years. I'll check with him, of course, but I'd say we could put him down as your introducing member. So you live on Angel Drive then? Yes, number 46. Oh, the old Martin house. How are you finding it? It's great. The garden is going to need a lot of work though. But we did buy the place because of the beautiful trees it has. I think I'm really going to enjoy living in this area. It's so peaceful. Yes, this is a lovely town. Do you have different types of memberships? You know, Different fees for the types of services you want. Yes, general membership is £900 per year. That gives you access to the clubhouse and restaurant and two free tickets to all home matches. Is there any discount if I'm playing cricket for the club? That's what happened at my last club. No, the price is the same, but you get access to the gym and swimming pool for no extra charge. All right, then. So, if I don't make the team, do I pay extra for the gym? I really need to join one, and usually the gym costs at a club are much cheaper than a regular gym. Yes, it's an extra £500 per year. Let's sign you up for general membership for now, and if you don't make the team, we can add on the gym fee later. That sounds like a good idea. By the way, what do you do for a living? I'm a new intern at the local hospital here. A what? I'm a doctor at the hospital. That's why I've moved here for the job. My wife is a lawyer, but she hasn't found a job here yet. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now let's sign you up for tryouts while I have you on the phone. Yes, when are they? 
This Saturday on The Oval at 9am, are you a bowler or a batsman? Or perhaps you are an all-rounder? I wish I were an all-rounder, but no, I'm a bowler. That's interesting. We are always looking for bowlers. And what was the last team you played for? I played the last three seasons with the Hillside Cricket Club in Dorset. That's where I was living until I moved here. I was born in the village of Hillside. In Dorset, did you say? Is that D-O-R-S-E-T? Yes. We actually won the county championship last year. How many years have you been playing cricket? All my life, really. But I've been playing competition cricket 17 years. Most people start when they are around 15 years old. But I started younger. OK, thank you very much. I'll give this information to the coach, so he will be expecting you on Saturday. Then you can come into the clubhouse and finalise your application. So, will I see you on Saturday? Yes, see you then. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man called Christian Jackson, staff coordinator of a trade fair facility, showing a new employee a map of the facility. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome everyone to this year's Sales Motivation Conference. I can already see a lot of faces that I recognize from previous conferences. So welcome back. And to all the new delegates, welcome. We hope that you gain a lot over the next four days. Boost your confidence and get lots of energy to go back to your jobs refreshed and ready to sell. We have 12 motivational speakers here for the conference, all ready to give you their ideas and tips for how to improve your sales performance. The keynote speaker is world-famous motivational star Melissa Foreman. She is going to open the conference today directly after I speak to you, and then she will have four two-hour sessions, one this afternoon and the other three on the mornings that follow at 11 a.m. Her presentation is called Bounce Back, and it is an entertaining talk about how to take the knockbacks and refusals, how to turn them around, and how to succeed in the long run. When you attend Melissa's talk, you will also have the opportunity to buy a signed copy of her latest book, with the same title as her presentation at a discounted rate. Melissa is giving the same talk four times, so we ask that you only attend her talk once so others are able to get to see it. I know that many of you have decided to attend this conference just to hear Melissa speak, but make sure you make the most of the other great motivators on our roster who all have incredibly inspiring offerings. There are four lecture halls here at this venue, and there will be three sessions per day, two each morning and one in the afternoon, from 9 to 11, from 11.30 until 1.30, and then from 3 until 5 p.m. Each speaker will be giving their presentation four times, so over the next four days, if you attend three sessions a day, you should be able to attend 
one presentation from every motivator. You might not all be able to achieve this because not only do we have talks from speakers, but quite a few interactive workshops where you will be able to work on your selling skills together. As you know, the theme of this conference is making the buy. With this, we mean putting the focus on the buyer. Often, sales methods are based on making the sale and using high pressure techniques. This hard sell strategy is stressful for both the salesperson and the buyer. We want to help you find ways of making the buyer come to you after your initial pitch, making them feel more in control of a purchasing situation, and ultimately more willing to buy product from you. Whether you are selling insurance, cars, clothing, or electronics, this conference will teach you skills that you can take away and put into practice. If your sales have been in a lull, we are hoping that the next few days will get you feeling positive and proactive again. We want to send you back out into the world completely prepared to work as the top salespeople in your fields. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, for the business end of things, I think most of you have already been through the registration process. If not, we ask that you get that out of the way before you attend any sessions and the conference fee should be paid in full. If you have driven here today and just registered, use the free parking card you received when you registered to leave the car park this evening. If you try to leave without being able to show your card, you will be charged for parking. So make sure you keep it with you. We ask that you wear your ID cards at all times when in the building. I probably don't need to tell you that this is a non-smoking venue, which includes outside in front of the building. Lunch will be available in the banquet hall every day from 1.30 until 3, where there will be a buffet that also has vegetarian, and vegan options. There are six seating areas with tea and coffee facilities scattered all over the venue. There are also plenty of power stations to charge your phones and laptops. We ask that all telephones be turned off during sessions and any recording of sessions is not permitted. If anyone has any questions, the registration desk will be staffed for the entirety of the conference and they will help you with anything you need. So again, welcome to our motivational conference, and we hope the next few days will get you all fired up to and ready to succeed in a very competitive and fast-paced work environment. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You hear two students, Anne and Fergus, planning a project that they need to submit to their university tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. I'm glad I'm doing this project with you, Fergus. I think we will work very well together. How do you think we should go about it? I really like the idea of a project on how potato crisps are made. I did find the whole production process a bit complicated in the lecture, though. It may only take about 15 minutes to get from potato to crisp in a sealed bag, but there are a lot of steps in that process. I think it would be clearer to us if we draw up a flowchart. Then we can see what pieces of machinery are needed for each point in the process. Good idea. I remember that the potatoes they use have to be less than 24 hours out of the ground, so they need to be transported by truck to the factory very quickly. Then, once they come off the truck, they are put straight into the crisp-making machine, and that's a continuously moving conveyor system that passes the potatoes through numerous barrels, tubs, funnels, and fryers. I just can't remember the order. Well, it's quite amazing, all completely automated. After the potatoes are loaded onto the conveyor belt, they pass through rolling barrels that brush the dirt off them. Then they travel along a water canal to the peeler. The peeler takes the skin off, right? Yes, the potatoes tumble around abrasive rollers until the skin is removed. My notes say the peeler can skin 12,000 pounds of potatoes an hour. Then they move on to another conveyor that separates the potatoes into sizes. The smaller ones drop through gaps in the conveyor, and the larger ones are chopped into smaller pieces that then fall into the rinser, joining the smaller potatoes. They are now all about the same size. Then, from what I remember in the lecture, they go along the rinser conveyor where they are sprayed with water before they get into the slicer. This is where they are cut into the crisp shapes. Here, they are spun in a huge drum with adjustable blades. From just one potato, they get enough crisps for a small packet. And then they are rinsed in cold water for about a minute before they pass along another conveyor belt, which dries off the excess water with an air blower. Okay, that's all a bit clearer now. So then they enter and move through the long fryer, which contains canola oil boiling at 190 degrees Celsius. They exit the fryer, still on a metal conveyor belt, and the excess oil drips through perforations in the belt. After that, they pass through an electronic scanner, which identifies any brown spots or defects, and blows individual chips off the conveyor belt with air pressure. It's amazing. Yes, that electronic scanner is genius. No more burnt crisps in the packet. Then they get a shower of salt and are sprayed with flavorings before dropping through a funnel. The funnel weighs out portions to be packaged. These portions then drop into bags that get heat sealed. And there you have a packet of crisps. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Okay, that flowchart has made everything a lot clearer. Now, our project is to come up with some way to reduce the amount of water consumption in the process. How are we going to go about this? We definitely need to visit a factory ourselves and talk to the people who run the machines. I want to find out why the slices need to be in cold water for one minute. This might be a part of the process that we could reduce. Perhaps the conveyor belt could be shorter here if we can, say, get the time down to 30 seconds and save that amount of water. Or we could recycle the water from that process, which is relatively clean, 
for the first rinsing step before the potatoes are peeled. What do you think? It's only the stage where the last of the dirt is being taken off. That's brilliant. Now the assignment doesn't have to be on the part of the process that involves frying and packaging. It is the preparation section that we need to focus on. Once we decide on the modifications to be done to the machine, we have to present them in design form. You are much better at that than me. I can write most of the text to go with it. That's fine with me, as long as the ideas come from both of us. Fergus, can you also arrange the factory visit? Then we can go together. I can't wait to see the machines in action. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about fillings in teeth. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we are going to look at how tooth decay is managed through the repair of dental caries by inserting cavity fillings into teeth. Statistically speaking, quite a few of you in this lecture theater would have fillings in your teeth, but being on the receiving end of a filling does not necessarily mean you know what is being done in your mouth. Tooth decay destroys the surface layer or the enamel of a tooth. This usually occurs in the natural crevices of the occlusal surfaces or the areas where the teeth touch, in the back molars of the teeth. The decay is caused by a buildup of bacterial matter called plaque, which breaks down the enamel surface. There are varying degrees of this decay. It may just affect a very superficial part of the enamel layer of the tooth, in which case the affected enamel can be simply ground down to reveal undamaged enamel. If the decay passes through the hard enamel layer and into the softer layer under it, called dentine, a cavity filling will need to be done. Should the cavity go as far as reaching the delicate, living pulp of the tooth, at the center of the dentine layer, a more aggressive type of procedure called a root canal filling is required, which involves destroying the pulp and the nerve endings and blood vessels it contains and completely filling the large cavity that is left. Another option is to remove the tooth entirely and replace it with a dental implant a metal post which is surgically embedded into the jawbone so that the prosthetic replacement tooth can be attached to it. Let's look at the most common procedure, which is a cavity filling for a tooth where the dentine layer has been compromised. The dentist cleans away the remaining decay in the tooth with a drill after the patient has received a numbing local anesthetic. This removal of decayed enamel and dentine prevents further damage, but the tooth now needs to be repaired with a filling to make it sound again. Cavity filling material was traditionally a silver metal amalgam, but now most dentists have started using composite resin to fill teeth, as it has the advantage of being able to be color matched to that of the enamel, while amalgam fillings are the color of metal. 
In the past, amalgam fillings were the more durable option, but now configurations of composite resin have been developed which are nearly as durable. A composite resin filling is injected into the prepared cavity in a paste form with a pump syringe that allows the dentist to fill the cavity in layers of the resin. Each layer is hardened separately by curing it with ultraviolet light in a process called photopolymerization. This means the paste can mold exactly to the shape of the cavity. After the final layer, the dentist then shapes the surface to match the natural occlusal surface of the tooth. Amalgam is used to fill the teeth in a similar way. Silver amalgam is a combination of silver, tin, and mercury and is mixed in a machine in the surgery before being inserted. Remember, the composite resin arrives already mixed in a pump syringe. With an amalgam filling, the dentist needs to remove more of the tooth to create retention grooves. This means carving certain angles and bevels into the teeth so that the filling locks into the structure of the tooth, a bit like a jigsaw. In this way, it is less likely to fall out. This is not necessary with composite resin, as it uses a chemical bonding process, rather than relying on more mechanical retention. The amalgam is packed tightly into the cavity and then molded and carved to fit the shape of the tooth surface. It takes about 24 hours to harden completely, so the patient needs to avoid chewing in that time. The important thing for both processes is that all the decaying tooth matter is completely removed before the tooth is filled, or the decay may return under the filling and might result in the loss of the tooth. The choice of whether to have composite resin or amalgam fillings can be decided upon the balance of a number of factors. Composite resin fillings are more aesthetically pleasing, as they are the same color as the teeth, and their insertion means that less tooth matter needs to be removed. So the teeth are less compromised in terms of strength and durability. Also, composite resin does not contain mercury, which is of concern to many patients. Amalgam fillings, however, are less expensive and more durable. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.